Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Modeler Mondays. Uh, this is the 12th episode in the live stream series, Modeler Mondays, every other Monday at 1 p.m. EST. Uh, Modeler Mondays provides tips, tricks, tutorials, and an insight into professional, unique professionals in the curriculums when creating in both VR and on desktop in Adobe Substance 3D Modeler. Um, you guys know me, I'm Val, I host this show. Um, on the community Discord, so you may know me as Foxer. Uh, and today we are here with some very special guests that I have managed to somehow talk into being here with me again. Uh, we have Wes McDermott and we also have Ryan Cornell. Hey everybody, it's awesome to be here. Thank you, Val. Ryan, it's so great to be here with you again. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It's always a good time to see you both. So, Yeah, so for, th for those who don't know you, uh, please give me an introduction of yourself. Wes, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, hey, I'm Wes. Uh, you know, I've been with the Substance team quite a while and i um, heading up our new Substance 3D Evangelism team. So, uh, Val, it's awesome. Thanks for having me on Modeler Mondays. I'm super happy to be here. Not at all. Thanks for coming on. And uh, Ryan, who are thou? Uh, yeah, so I am a, for work, or my day job, I'm a technical artist um, slash, well, I don't know, I'm a whole bunch of things at work. So anyway, but I work in game development and been doing it for the last five years, been a designer, artist for pretty much all my life. And so, yeah, um, and now I'm doing puppet stuff, which is not <laughs> totally unheard of, but I, because in our industry, there's always, you know, moving around things is a part of it. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so for those who don't know <laughs> Ryan, he's currently known as the Puppet Guy on Twitter. Uh, for those who haven't seen his work yet, he's done some really incredible stuff. I'm just rolling through like the slideshow of some of uh, the, the stuff that he's working on currently. So Ryan, um, you've been on the show previously. You have made these puppets in Modeler. And so describe a little bit of your workflow now that you're getting into puppetry uh, with Unreal Engine 5. Yeah, so... <laughs> For me, it's been kind of a journey of how to create some of these characters and bring them into Unreal. I mean, Unreal you know, allows for a lot of different things. So, but I thought a fun challenge would be using Modeler to create the characters and then bring them into that workflow. And it's something that I thought about for a while. And until the you know the software has improved so much over time that it's really allowed me to do that. So <laughs> I thought, well, now's a good time to just do it and try it out. So. Yeah, so I just started that workflow of starting a modeler, bringing it into other applications to enhance that modeler experience and finally bring it into uh, Unreal. Hey, Ryan. Are, oh, sorry, Val. Oh, no. Hey, Ryan, are, are you using like the, the desktop version or the VR version to create your models? I am VR in modeler uh, just because I love that sort of tactile almost feeling because of the controller and you just c control so much with the camera and the mm -hmm. character so yeah so, so I'm, okay go ahead so. yeah i'm sorry i gotta ask you this because you know going back to the first time i met you uh i, for I forgot where we it was the substance days i think right where we yeah, was in Adobe. yeah yeah yeah. It, yeah and so um one of the things I was so intrigued about by looking at your work was just the the I, the, the whole concept of how you come up with these ideas and these characters. And if anyone who follows Ryan, which you totally should, uh, you have like. Oh, I think we might have lost West. <laughs> Ryan, are you there? All the time. Like, how are you coming up with the idea to make these characters? Like, what's your process there? I'd love to hear about that. So the process for me is really. Um... And I started doing this a while ago. It really just starts with a shape, right? And I just start to manipulate that shape. And in my mind, I'm always thinking about something that I could, I could possibly come up with. So it's a very um, abstract process. I don't put a lot of thought into it before I go into something. Um, sometimes I'll have a general idea about what I want to make, but it's, I don't have a concept to go from most of the time. So I'm just constantly just shifting shapes around until it becomes something. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that looks like this. And then I just, boom, go crazy with that idea. And it's just a domino effect of, oh, I should add this, I should add that to make it look like a certain thing. So so it's pretty untraditional in the fact that I'm not using anything to really like go from, but I think it's just overall experiences in life or just what I see just in general, just coming up with like these weird things. But I'm trying to, 
really try to be as original as possible. It's really hard to do these days because there is so, so much influence out there. And that's, so my process is really just let it go, be free and try to make something that's a little bit different. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's okay if it doesn't sometimes. It's, a, it's, a, it's awesome to hear it like that. It just seems, yeah, it seems like it's, there's no stress involved. You're just having fun, which is the whole point of it, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's always been about having fun first because art is fun. I mean, it's a fun process. I really love it. And, and it took me a long time to get to that point because before I was always stressing about it. I had to look like this. It had to be, you know, it has mm, to be yeah. perfect. That's what you think the mindset is supposed to be for like getting a job. Well, it wasn't really like that. It was really just, what is your process? Come up with a process. Have fun with it and just, that helps your creativity right there. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, man. Thank you. That's that's great. Yeah, and it's so cool to be able to see your work too because I think it really translates. Like, I can see that you're having fun with it. And I also see that you also have Modeler pulled up. So I'm going to switch um, to your screen share really quick. Who is this guy? <laughs> Who is yeah, this? so this one was like a really random thing it started off as like i wanted to create like some sort of dinosaur -y looking thing but then it ended up looking like a rat so i'm like i'm just gonna go with it <laughs> um, but in modeler it was like a really quick process um, that's the beauty about modeler is that i can just get in there and make stuff really fast i mean it probably took about an hour to make and it's just like the base mesh right yeah. and that's really sort of my thing is like i just want to make the base and worry about colors and everything else a little bit later. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just like, oh, let's just make this weird thing, but have in my mind that it was gonna be a puppet. So, you know, make sure that things are segmented and things that kind of make sense and how something would move, like the jaw would be you know, kind of separate and hinged a bit to make it look like it's some sort of puppety thing. And, um, and that's kind of been my my theme for the last few months is just like playing around with these puppety ideas and try to make them as different as possible, like with traditional puppets that you would see versus something that's really out there. And that's been like a really fun process for me. So that's, this guy is like the really out there. As you can see, there's like no legs or anything. So, mm -hmm. so I hide those things, which people <laughs> probably already know. <laughs> but Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of magic behind this stuff, so. Yeah. yeah. You're like the new Jim Henson. Is it Jim Henson or Jim Benson? Henson. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And have you, yes. you've seen, you've seen the old shows. Were you inspired by any like Muppetry stuff before you came up or? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, of course. I was a huge fan of, um, like, this is really going to date me, but like the Great Space Coaster. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. But I was a big fan of that. I was a big fan of just the Muppet show in general. Um, Fraggle Rock was like really huge um, for me. So it was just like, I just love like the floppiness of characters and how they're just so unique in a way that it's not like planned out animation. Like a lot of times you'll see like these weird things happen and it, and it was just a natural part of it. And so that, that stuff is really inspiring to me. Right. I'm a huge fan of that type of work. So I'm a big fan of like Dr. Seuss. So it's like kind of bringing all these little weird things into play um that really like resonates with me so yeah i mean i was a huge fan growing up awesome how, how long does the process like so you sculpted this guy here like how long does that take yeah so it takes about i would say anything from since i'm in vr i don't want to be in vr for like multiple hours and the time does go by super fast but i don't want to be in it all the time because i do that for my day job i'm in vr all the time so for me, it's like, I want to get in there. I want to make something really quick. So the process of making your character is probably about anything from 30 minutes to two hours at most. So that part of it isn't really that bad in comparison to what I would do. Like if I was in ZBrush or something like that, where it takes me a little bit longer to come up with those ideas. In VR, I'm just like, I just want to get in there and kind of do the thing yeah be done and then move it on to the next stage so yeah so character design is usually about yeah 30 minutes to two hours 
Yeah. So when you click into your mesh here, you like it's interesting because in the last Modeler Mondays we had you on, you actually do create your models so that they are interlocked with each other, or what is a better word for that? Like it's very similar to if you were to have IK or FK handles on them, it makes sense. Like everything is parented in the right way, so that you have that natural animation. Is that the same, or is that true of this character as well? Um, for this one, not as much. Um, I usually do that so that I can pose the character like in Modeler and get it going. Um, so yeah, I'll like group the hand with the arm and then with the upper arm. So then you can just move those things separately and then pose it. It just makes it a lot easier. Um, and here I wasn't too, I didn't have to worry about that too much. Okay. So like, I just know I got to put it in sort of some sort of pose so I can rig it. Cool. And so that's why it's, you know, it's looking like it's a pose. Because puppets, for me, I have to pose them in certain ways versus like a T pose, which you would normally do. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, it just depends on the person who's rigging things too. Like at work, they want them certain ways. Um, yeah, so for this one, I didn't really have to worry about that too much. Mm. Okay. Very cool. And so. And it's not perfect either. It's like there's certain things that are not symmetrical, <laughs> which <laughs> makes it harder <laughs> for me in the long run. Are you closer now? <laughs> but it's like. I don't care. It's okay. It brings some character to it. That's excellent. So what is your export process? So now that you have the model done and uh, you're getting ready to like get this get this character over to Unreal Engine, like what what's your next process here for the export? Like you know, like what what are you doing in terms of like decimation? Are you letting Modeler create the UVs for you? Like what how's your setup go? Um, so in the most so what I'm doing for the most part and I won't actually export this but i'll show you is i typically will use quads for characters just because it's a little bit easier i don't have to worry about too much re topo work or retopo work and so i just use the quads and then i try and figure out like do i want i usually export from anywhere from sixty thousand to a hundred thousand it seems to be a good sweet spot for me and i just want to make sure that you know, it's going to be fine in Unreal. So typically what I'll do is I'll export them as quads. And the quads for the um, the remesh look pretty great. So I've been really happy with that. And so, yeah, so then I just bring it into, um, oops, that was great. So then I just bring it into, um, sometimes I'll bring it into ZBrush and just regroup things. Um, but I don't, what I'm trying to do is not do rework inside of another application. Like, I just want the model to be the model. Mm. Export it, yeah. make sure that things look decent enough. Um, since it's just me doing the work, I don't have to worry about too much of everything has to be perfect to send out to somebody else to use. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of like, oh, that looks pretty good. The, you know, the quads mm -hmm. look decent in certain areas. Like, they're not going to stretch too much or they're not going to be too crazy. Um, so yeah, that's just pretty much getting it out of Modeler. And then um, for the UV process, sometimes I'll do an auto UV unwrap inside of ZBrush or, yeah, typically I'll do it there because I do like to see it a little bit just to see if things are gonna make sense to me. Um, and then from there, I'll just bring it in the painter if I'm gonna be doing the texturing there. Oh, great, great. Cool. Which I can bring up for you. Yeah, I would love to see it. And we also would love to see like aspects of how you're working in um, UV5 later on. But so this is Substance Painter, right? Yes, yeah, so this is Substance Painter here. Um, oops. Do that again. So yeah, um, and I know it's going to look totally different in UE. So I'm just like, or in Unreal. So I'm just like, okay, I just want the base kind of texture. Because I know I'm going to bring in like subsurface scattering to so make the skin look a little more translucent. And I'm going to do all these other little things inside of Unreal with my materials that I typically will use. Um, so, so yeah, I just want to get in there and kind of get my textures in place. Like I'm just like, this is all very rough, but I just know, like, I already know how it's kind of going to look inside of Unreal because I've been doing this process for a long time now. And so I figured, well, this looked pretty good. I'll stick with this. And yeah, just the, the whole painting process. Um, I have a lot of different like pieces to this guy, so which makes it a little bit harder inside of um, 
painter, it still it still works, but it, it should really be one piece <laughs> and with like material <laughs> IDs and such. But yeah, but this <laughs> works for my workflow. Yeah, I don't good. condone my methods, by the way. I just I just do stuff and make it work for me. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah, as long as it looks okay in the final, I'm okay with that. Yeah, when you do your export out of Painter, are you like using like, uh, are you packing any maps or do you even worry about that? Do you just export all just PBR metal rough or do you actually use like the UE4 preset? Like what's your setup on that? I just use the PBR workflow. So I'm basically just exporting out normal uh, roughness and metallic mm -hmm. and uh, base colors. So all basic stuff. This is a lot of this stuff isn't like really, really tricky. I'm trying to use like the basics of everything just so that if I was to hand off anything, it's really not hard for anybody else to, to pick up. They'll, they would understand like, okay, I'm not using like too many presets, you know, because that starts to get a little bit confusing for others too. If I ever have to explain this stuff like I am today. So <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty simple. And yeah, I, I might actually have like my preset set up, which is, yeah, it's just the normal PBR metallic roughness. And then I'm just checking on the, um, yeah, color roughness and metallic and normals. And that's all I really need. Cool. When you've done some of your characters that have fur and stuff, are you creating any like, um, like fur maps or anything like that in painter, like masks or anything, or do you just, are you just applying that? Pr I mean, we'll get into it when we get in into UE, but like, I was just wondering, like, do you ever use painter for any masking like that? No, I have none. I haven't even thought about that. And I'm sure I probably could do that. But yeah, I haven't really thought about doing it that way. I typically will just like say which vertices I want to have hair pop out of instead of, um, cause I'll use cinema 4d also. Mm. So I'm basically just selecting vertices and, popping out hair from those areas. And that process is actually pretty simple too. So I'm not making any maps inside of Painter, although that is something that I should actually try because yeah, I have never thought about doing that. That's cool. That's like a lot of different softwares into one. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mind using like a whole bunch of different things. It's because so many of these applications have so many like crazy features or different features that I really enjoy. And it's just, I don't know, I just, I've never really cared about how many different types of softwares I've used or which types of softwares I've used. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah, it's just, it's just fun to create stuff. So. Yeah. And I think that's something that uh, we really want to emphasize too. Like creators are creators that are not defined by the tools that they use. I feel like that's something that um, is often forgotten, but it is always cool to see what tools are being used. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important for people to see what people are using because I think you know, a lot of times we'll get sort of these ideas like this is the only thing to use where it's just like, I don't know, then you're kind of missing out on some of the other things, especially if there's like a trial available, just try it, yeah. mess around, have fun. <laughs> we can tell we're yeah. the experimentalists in the, in the chat, hey? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean... That that's the main thing to always think about is like the the software. It's just a tool in a toolbox, right? And and what really matters is like you know the artist and you, the t tools and techniques that you use. And yeah, sometimes it's fun to use a new tool here and there. But I mean, like yeah, just use what works for you. It doesn't really matter. And I think that's one of like you said, Val. It's one of the great things about Substance is that we're pretty agnostic when it comes to like different workflows. So it's like it kind of fits anywhere. Use what you like. You know what works for you. Um, I was actually really impressed when we talked, Ryan, that you're using Cinema 4D. So I started, you know, getting to that recently. Uh, that's been one tool that I've, I've never used in years that I've been yeah. a 3D artist. So I was like, oh, I've been having fun with that lately. So, yeah, I'm sure you'll get into that more in your workflow. But it's I fun will. to try these new things. And I haven't opened it yet, so maybe yeah. I can start. <laughs> that was the one program I didn't open before this. That's okay. Which I should, should have had done before. So, um okay. But yeah, Cinema 4D has been great. I decided like I want to try to give myself like a year to learn something. Um, like one year I spent learning Houdini, which was like always just way over my head. Like, how am I going to make this work? Because it's so, it's such a unique software. And then, so I was like, okay, well, I'll buy one year of it and I'll dedicate myself to learning it. And, and that's just kind of what I've done. Although I've probably forgotten everything now from Houdini. So now it's like, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen with cinema. 
yeah. But yeah, I'm giving myself a year to really just kind of understand it and um, go in there. And I found out that they had really great like, hair tools and it was super simple to just make hair. And um, I had started, this whole puppet thing started just on a whim. Um, I mean, I had known how to do puppetry before in my job, um, but it was like, until I actually made something in Cinema 4D and started moving it around with the hair, and that was when I had showed my, my one of my concept uh, artists at work. He's like, oh my gosh, that looks like, you know, like a Muppet, because it has the hair and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, it really does. It's really fun to use. Um, I wonder if we could, or if I could come up with some way to make it work in real time instead of Unreal. And so I was like, well, I already know the first system instead of Unreal pretty well from just experiments. So I thought, well, if I can find a way to export it, I'm sure I can do it. And that's how it all kind of came about. Okay. Um, and since I already kind of knew how to do the puppetry, I was like, well, this could be a really fun thing if I can get it to work and it ended up being super fun to do. Oh. So, um, so yeah, so the, here's the character inside of Cinema 4D and this is like some of the, let's, I'll just go with the chin hair. Um, I'll just kind of show you how it's, how it looks. Like no, nothing looks impressive until I like get it into <laughs> Unreal. It's always like, uh, everything looks a little janky or whatever, but... <laughs> Kind of doesn't look good. Trust the process, hey. Yeah, you trust the process. I could do like little snapshot renders, but I'm just like, well, if I do that, sometimes it slows me down. And I like to work pretty fast because if I don't, I'll lose my train of thought and says, ah, I don't know what that thing's gonna look like. So I'm just gonna keep rolling with it, just go with it. Right. So um so yeah, I mean this is kind of how it looks inside of Cinema 4D. Um let me actually just show you really quick of how easy it actually is to add hair. And you basically just select your vertices. Let me make sure I'm selecting. And you say, okay, yeah, I want hair right here. That looks great. And so then I just add hair. And so, yeah, it doesn't look like hair yet, but to figure out, well, okay, this I'm going to need it like a certain length. And once you're here you they have these awesome materials and the materials pretty much drive the hair and then you just select like different types of things you can mess with different modifiers to curl the hair to do all these other little things you can also go in there and comb it if you really need to i don't do a lot of that because they're puppets and the hair is usually always a mess yeah. so for me it's kind of like <laughs> thankfully i don't have to do much of that but i have some yeah. presets like this one is called mess and that's just kind of how it works. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so if you were to go to generate this, you would generate your splines, and you can kind of get a preview of what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And it just looks like this this mess of hair, oh. which is OK. And it's a ton of hair. But a lot of times, you can dial that down and figure out other ways to do it. Yeah. And so once that's you're happy with something like that, you just need to make sure that you're exporting out splines. Okay. And you're exporting out the spline and you're just exporting it as an Alembic file. Ah, and once okay, it, yeah. Once that's done, you're pretty much done with the hair process. You're really just selecting, you're making the hair, you're tuning it, you're giving it a style. Because Unreal doesn't do the styling for you, it's your other applications that would do the styling. It, that does look a lot more simple. Like um, we had an internal project we worked on at work, and uh, we were using Maya and XGen to create uh -huh. hair, and then exporting yeah. it as Alembic. And I mean, XGen's fine. I, I've, I've always liked Maya, but it was like, uh, yeah, it's not. It, it seems like it's a little bit more extra work <laughs> than, than what it is you're showing here. Yeah, there's a lot more clicking involved. I think with yeah. XGen you can get more in depth with your hair. There's a lot of settings, um, yeah. which I don't. I don't need a lot of settings for these maybe for a different character you know i might use something like that and i think i used it for a different puppet that i had i use x mm. um i think for the long neck puppet that i have um, i oh. use x -Gen for that and that was months ago that i tried that and then i was just like oh now i'm doing the puppet stuff let's see if it actually works and it actually worked in Unreal pretty good so but yeah this is just an easy workflow for me 
And then, so while you, while you're here in cinema, like so, you you've got you have your hair that you've worked on, and then as as far as the rig, it looks like you're building the rig in here as well. Correct. Yeah, and um, I mean, creating rigs, you can do that in any platform. My rigs are not they're not sophisticated at all. The sophisticated part comes in Unreal, and it's really not even sophisticated there. Mm. Um, but I really just want to build like super simple rigs for these and they're all going to be a little bit unique depending on the character and if they have a mouth or not or if you know certain things to move a little different but yeah it's basically just like i had two spine areas a neck and simple simple arms i'm not using a lot of finger stuff yet mm, um just yeah. because it's just a lot more to account for yeah and in puppets you never really other than like some characters will have like the hands that appear inside of puppets that work, but for the most part, they're just rods holding them up, and they're just kind of moving. The yeah, they're, they're just <laughs> flopping everywhere. Yeah, which is amazing. Yeah, I love. Yeah, it makes my job a lot easier. So, um, so yeah, I just want to make sure like areas that are going to flop, that I'll typically have a joint for those because in Unreal, that's where I'm adding all the physics and everything for your arms to move around. Mm. So um, yeah, it's just a basic system. I have something for a jaw. I've got the head, and I have eyes. And I, I'm working on a new system where all the eyes that I make are modular. So I typically take out the eyes once I'm actually inside of Unreal or I mask them out. And I'll add these new eyes in there that have the ability to follow things. And build up oh, things. wow. So That's crazy. Too. Yeah, it's, and it's a little bit easier too. I don't have to worry about rigging the eyes as much. Yeah. Um, although that's not super hard, but it's, it's another thing to worry about. Mm. Speaking of which, can we sneak into one of your Unreal files to check it out? Yeah, of course. Uh, let me actually turn on my controller too, so that that actually works. So I'm moving stuff around. Yeah. And we're so blessed mm -hmm. to have Wes here today too, because he's also um, a Unreal Engine. That's the word I'm looking for. Expert. I like using it. Yeah, I like the tool. I'll say that. I like the tool. Like, yeah, I, this is this is my favorite part of the whole talk with you, Ryan, because I just I mean, I don't, I'll try not to ask so many questions. Uh, please, if anyone oh, in the <laughs> comments has or anyone watching, please ask your questions. But like, yeah, I was so impressed with like this. I just went like, how did you do this? How did you do that? You know, it's like this is the best part, I think, is getting into Unreal, like where all the magic happens. Like, this is such a it's incredible that you did all this. It's <laughs> It's a process. Uh, yeah. It's a, uh, you know, let me just close down some of these applications if I can. It's funny, none of them are asking me if I really want to close them or not. So let me just make sure. There we go. Sorry. Okay. This takes a second. Um, We're saving RAM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Slot yeah. I need to, I need to <laughs> Totally need to upgrade soon. Oh no. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Cool. Fun stuff. Let me just hide that down here. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, everything crashes. Yeah. Uh, it, typically, that's how it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Unreal seems to be happy now. There we go. Okay. So, yeah. So now that character is actually inside of Unreal. Um, and as you can see, it looks pretty funky in here. There's a lot of weird things that happen um a lot of people ask about how i do like camera movement how i do certain things inside of unreal and a lot of it is just it's pretty basic stuff um like i said i'm not really using any plugins or anything special to make these things work it's just you know using already what's available to me i don't want to have to use a whole bunch of different things to make it work um so yeah, this is what it looks like inside of Unreal. Um, you see the hair, it's all exported fine. Um, the other thing about hair is that you need to make sure that you're exporting it from, if you want it to move around with your character in a proper way, you gotta make sure that you're doing it on a rigged character um, or one that has skeletons just because if it's gonna move, and because you, you need to bind it, you need to bind that hair to the skeleton inside of Unreal. Could you show you that? that? Yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, could you just, I mean, you don't have to go super deep into it, but like, yeah, so you've imported in the Olympic file, then how are you attaching that to the character? Yeah, so once you're in to the Olympic file itself, um, you're basically, instead of Unreal, you 
you just right click on the Alembic file that you've brought in and you just say create binding and that's it. So once you've wow. done that, you just select your skeletal match that you're using. Yeah. And you can also do things where you can interpolate to like a different skeletal mesh and it might work if there's one that's sort of similar. Um, somebody from Epic probably has a better explanation than I do about how that actually works. Um, and once that's connected to you or to the um, <laughs> to the actual character, then um, it just kind of pops into place and it nice. starts to work. <laughs> but so how I'm doing that, and let me just bring up my blue real quick. So all these characters have a, a blueprint, they're all actors, um, and inside of that blueprint is where all the controls happen. And that's where I add the first, so if I come into here. So you would have to do something like, hey, I want to add the fur to this, so you would add the groom component. You would select groom, and then you would say, okay, well, once it's there, then you would add in your... Um, your binding asset, which is going to bind to the character, and then you would have your groom asset, which is the actual groom asset. And let me actually open up the groom asset so I can show you what that looks like inside of Unreal. Where does the physics come into play? Is that in the groom asset? Yeah, exactly, in the groom asset. Um, and the physics is basically a button click, and it actually will apply the physics to your character or to the actual hair strands themselves because it's a strand based system it's not hair cards or anything like that so yeah. so they're basically like i want to say splines like i said somebody from epic probably has a way better explanation than i do about <laughs> all this stuff i've wanted to reach like the groom person but i never really have so so this is like the, the this is the chin hair and wow. so you have these different options um I always set up like five different LODs for the hair just because if something is bogging down the system, I have a switch that will make it go down to a lower LOD so that things will move a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, just depending on like how much hair I have in the scene or if I have multiple puppets in a scene, sometimes I'll want one that has a lower um, count of, I guess, segments for, for the hair. So, and it's really easy. You just basically click this plus button and I'll just add it'll just add them for you oh. and, and so that part's nice and you can go in there and you can say hey this is what i want at this lod i want to have less strands or i want to have less um segments for it and you can do all that so and then it's basically there's another area to where you can define like hair width and simple things like that tip scale root scale so you can kind of define those things that are there as well. Like I said, all the um, all the other stuff is done in Cinema 4D as far as how it's going to kind of look as far as the curliness or all the waviness and things like that. Um, and so once that's kind of set, then you go into the physics area and you basically just click on Enable Simulation and that will bring the physics to life. And then you can decide on things like how much stiffness do I want? You, those types of things like bendiness. How much do you want it to bend? If you want to keep it in place, like some puppets, I don't want the hair to swim around all that much. Or and there's mm -hmm. all those things that you can actually go in here and just play around with. And these settings you can play around with for hours. Um, and it's it's actually pretty fun because it is kind of just moving around and you can kind of see some stuff, and it's it's pretty interesting. So, yeah, so then it just gets applied and you can see it connected there. It's running a little slow, but that's because I have the other thing open. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably going to have to get to the other stuff before oh, this. Like, yeah, yeah, there, there's actually a question <laughs> that came in. This is a great, um, uh, this is a great segue. Uh, yeah. So one, one of the questions was coming in from the chat was, any thoughts on creating custom maps for like changing color in game? Like, for example, leather armor with green accessories, changing from green to blue and different colors and stuff like that. So I guess at that point, we can start diving into your custom material setups. Yeah, so in Unreal, I usually create like one master material. Like I'll have some for it. It depends on the actual asset, because um, there is sometimes I just want to use like a non UV workflow. So I'll have like vertex colors that you can use. 
but then I want to change up like how much saturation on this <clears throat> on the actual paint or things like that. So I'm always setting up master materials. Let me just show you a, uh, one of these. I'll just bring up the body. So I have a master material that's going to expose out your base colors, your metallics, everything that I had exported from um, from Painter that I can just grab those textures and just throw them in here really quick. And then I have things like tints that I probably have stolen from somewhere else. And that's where you can go in and kind of change my colors and such. And you, you know, you just have all these different controls. I, yeah. So depending on what it is, I'll always have a material master that's set up first. And then you just make that, you make dynamic instances or you just make a, an instance of that material so that you can change them really simple. Like in this view here, I'll bring out the master. So my master is really messy, <laughs> but you kind of <laughs> see like, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, I probably, I didn't prep this one for the, no, it's <laughs> for the good. show. But... Looks like crochet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my process is like, hey, just get it done, man. Just make it work. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, this is where I would add in everything. This is where I'd expose all the variables that I need to change. Right. Um, and that's basically how you would go about changing um, colors. Or I would just make a new material and just throw it onto the character. Because my characters typically will have all the different slots for materials uh, and i'll just do it that way um yeah did do you ever think about using the substance plugin in ue i have and i have before and we've used it at work and it works great i haven't used it much for these puppets just because it's just i'm so used to going kind of the old school way of just these other types of workflows um and I would say, like, I don't know if it, was there a 5.1 update? I'm sure there was. But. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did have a, a 5.1 update. And um, yeah, so it should be good. And uh, the, the latest plugin is really nice because it does come with things like, you know, triplanar shader templates and stuff like yeah. that, which which I thought was really, really cool. Um, so yeah, you know, those kind of things are in there worth trying. I was just curious because like, uh, but but again, you're kind of showcasing how with your master material, you're creating your own controls for changing colors and stuff. Yeah. And inside of my non UV workflow, I've created just from things I've seen online, uh, my own triplanar workflow. So I'll have like my own triplanar stuff for normal maps for, um, just regular albedo type of maps, um, our base color maps. And, um, so I'll use those and I have a switch between like world space and I think, Substance does this too, like world space and local space and being able to just change the rotations of things because sometimes yeah. I don't want it to be anything and it's just nice to just be able to bring it in there and just do the thing. Um, but like I said, I have used it in the past, especially when I was using designer more. I was using designer to create things and be able to expose those parameters so that I can use them inside of the Substance plugin. So that's great. Oh yeah, the late the latest version is really nice because, like you said, it does come with those different like local world space, all those controls. Yeah. So it's it's I think in the, the latest version, it's it's really nice to use. Yeah, I definitely need to start stepping up in that. I've been so heads down on just these workflows that I have. It's just yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have but thoughts on the on the plugin, Wes? Just curious. I'm sorry. What'd you say, Val? Oh, I said, do you have any thoughts on the plugin yourself, Wes? Uh, I do, yeah. I, I've actually really started using it a ton lately, oh, okay. um, especially since we, um, since they added the the feature for like the triplanar and stuff. It's been awesome because like um, I had been working, you know, creating some stuff in Modeler and then just bringing it in, not even doing UVs at all, and then just using the yeah. Substance plugin to apply stuff triplanar. And it's just been oh, so nice and it's quick to get something going really fast. I've, I've, I've super thoroughly enjoyed that process. It's been a lot of fun. So I remember yeah. you doing it and showing like the, the wood, like doing stuff like that is like so perfect for triplanar mapping. Just because it's yeah. Just, you know, yeah. It's, just, it's fast. It's really, really fast. It's great because you can, like you said, you can just tweak like, oh, here, it doesn't fit on this one. Let me rotate it and then adjust like the the, the fall off. You know, it needs to be a little harder edge or softer and you can do these quick sure. blends and just crank out stuff really fast. I, I, I was pretty happy with it. 
Yeah, the faster the better, especially yeah. for my work. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, the question I get asked a lot is how do I actually move these things and how do I go into the process of getting them to that state? Like, how do you move it with the controller? Like, how does that even work? Um, so maybe I should go over that a little bit because that is one of the most popular questions that I get on Twitter. Um, is how yeah, that'd it. be awesome. And there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, I'm sure the fine folks at Epic would probably want me to use Control Rig, which is their newer system, and it's probably way better than what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm using the pretty old school method of just an animation blueprint, um, but it's but it's something that I've known for like the last five years. It's kind of been my go-to. I learned how to do this a while back when we were tasked to make an avatar move with uh, with your controllers, with uh, motion controllers. And so from that is where I first learned it. And it was basic, like I saw an old PDF document of somebody had written down like how to move things with a controller. And it was basically, how do you move like a skeleton with a controller? And I don't know where that PDF doc is. I wish I could because it was really cool to understand at that point, like how to move things. And, and since we've done it a few different times, it's kind of like, okay, well now I, I get it. But it's actually fairly simple. Instead of an animation blueprint, so a skeleton needs to be, you basically will have your skeleton inside that you've exported from Cinema 4D or wherever you're going to export that from. And you have your rig that's set up. Um, as you can see, I have no eyes. I'm scary. <laughs> um, so once you have your skeleton set up and it's all good instead of Unreal, you've applied your materials. like. Don't do this for a video game setting because this is a lot of materials on one app for one. <laughs> it's, it's like 15 or something like that. I do not yeah. do that <laughs> at all. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd probably get in trouble if I did something like this at work, which I, I don't actually do character stuff at work. So. Um, so anyways, once that's set up, what you do is you basically right click and you say, hey, let's create an animation blueprint. And that's what you're going to need to um, create like all the, the things for the bones to move. So once you do that, it's kind of set up for you. Mm -hmm. It'll bring your skeleton in and it usually just will show one little node here, which is like your output. And everything needs to stream to that output. Okay. So if you want to move around, let's say the jaw, for instance, um, you would create something where you need to modify that bone, which is basically just called modify bone. And so you get that node. Let me just stream into that. And you say, hey, which bone do you want to modify? I want to modify the jaw. So we get the jaw. And you also need to think about like how you want the jaw to move. Uh, basically, I use rotations for most things. I think most people in video games use rotations or some things where you need to actually translate something. But um, in this case, we're going to rotate the jaw. So I just want to add to the existing pose that I already have. And you basically can test it already by just clicking compile and you can see that it's hard to see Come over here. You can kind of test it out. Okay, now it's moving the actual jaw. Oh, okay. so, so then what you need to do is figure out, okay, well, I need to get that information out of Unreal, or not out of Unreal, but out of the animation blueprint into another thing to be able to control that. So what you would do is you would set up a variable and it's basically a right click and you promote the variable and it's just a rotation. So and then you can rename it, whatever you rename it. Rename mine jaw rotate. And so eventually when I get to the blueprint portion of it, we just we need to say, hey, I need to be able to move the jaw rotate variable with my controller. So I'll delete that. The, the things that are a little complicated or not really complicated because Unreal does so much for you is like IK stuff. Um, so you don't do the IK instead of the other applications, you do it instead of Unreal. Uh, unless you're an animator and you do all the animation instead of Maya or Blender or whatever, Cinema 40, whatever you're going to use. Um, in this case, the IK is going to happen instead of Unreal, um, especially for puppeting anything. 
So for the head, it's a different scenario. I typically don't do any sort of IK for head, but since this guy has a few bones that are attached, I thought oh, it'd be kind of cool to be able to move this in sort of like an arm fashion. So where it'd be bending down, other things bend down with it. So let me just set this up. I'm going to set up a, a Faber IK. So this is like forward and backwards IK. Um, I'm not a pro in knowing the IK stuff. I'm like very basic. So I, I know some of the names, like I said, from work. I don't know exactly what they mean, but I just know that, hey, this works for this thing. So, so yeah. Um, so that's why a lot of times on Twitter, I'll have a lot of these questions. I'm like, I, it's so hard for me to answer because I don't know the right way to say a lot of these things. And I apologize for that. And I probably should, but. No, it's, it's awesome. I love that you're saying this because like it makes it to where like, um, it just feels accessible. Like when I first saw this, my first thought was, oh, I could never do that. You know? And I was like, ah, but then after talking to you and then like, you know, when we had our, our first talks about it, it was just like so eye opening and inspiring. Cause I was like, wow, I mean, it's really not that. And Ryan did it like this. And I, and I love how it doesn't matter. You don't know, you don't know all this technical stuff maybe, but it doesn't matter because you're able to get your artwork and you got your stuff to work and it's great. And your vision was realized. I just think that's awesome. Like super inspiring, you know, cause it's like, you know, we, we all get held down by like these wait i don't know enough i didn't and i'm afraid to start you know and i don't do anything because wait i gotta spend all this prep learning but no you i yeah. love how you just jumped in and did it ryan it's awesome yeah that's the part of it that i think a lot of people have a hang up on and it's like i need to know everything about the thing before i do the thing and yeah. you don't you really just need to know enough about yeah. certain things to really make the realization of what you're trying to accomplish you know you don't need to know 100 percent about anything inside i mean that's what i've learned about the gaming the gaming industry because everybody i've talked to and anybody at work they don't know everything about every software that they're using they know like the things to get it done to get their work done like instead of maya i mean probably our 30 artists use probably 20 percent of maya or 10 percent of what maya is function like able to do but i think people going into it think that they need to know a hundred percent of it and it's just not the case really focus on what you're trying to do like think about that thing that you're trying to make and not the everything that has to go into it all at once um and just be able to like oh how does that work and maybe ask those questions but i think that narrows down your your searching too as far as like how to do something a lot of times it's just also the right things to search for like, that's also yeah. hard too. Those are things that you learn yeah. as you go along as well, because that could be a broad search, and the internet is pretty vast. So, so yeah, like, um, a lot of like formal education um, background stuff that comes in from there, because you kind of learn like, oh, there is the best way or a right way to do something. So I think it makes people really hesitant to go into these softwares and just try. And I think that's something yeah. that um, you do really well, Ryan, is that you're able to go in and experiment and play. And, you know, do the next cool thing that you just want to try. And you might not know what it's called, but I mean, hey, if it works, it works, right? And so, yeah, you'll, yeah. No. you'll get there. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, have any, I didn't have any formal training in Unreal. But I would say you would want to learn the basics before really tackling something like this because you want to know how to move around in that. The editor, just how to move the camera around, you know, it's different. It's like a first person shooter type of camera. So you're kind of, if you know those kind of things, then that helps. But, right. you know, like we come from software industry, so we're using like alt to kind of move your camera. And that doesn't <laughs> really work that well <laughs> inside of Unreal. So, yeah. you know, so that sort of thing, you just need to wrap your mind around. It's a game engine, first of all. So mm -hmm. you just need to say, okay, well, it's like a game. How does this work? But anyways, okay, so I'll go back real quick to just the IK um, stuff, and I'll just do the head, and I'll do the arms. I think the arms are pretty cool to see. Um, so you really just, you want to affect the the effector is what it's called. Those are the things that you want to be able to move. That's going to be like your end point to move your IK. And those are big things to move around. So so for this guy, I would want to move that, the head. The socket's on the very top, so I'm going to use these things called this one bone that I'm calling sockets with the really eye sockets, which bad naming, 
So like I said, don't follow my conventions for naming me. <laughs> just how I do things. You can say, figure out, oh, what's my tip going, bone going to be? It's going to be those sockets again. Cause that's where I'm getting grabbed from. And I'll, the root is basically the end bone of the last place it's going to affect. Or it's going to affect everything in between those areas. So, so I'm going to check the neck and hit compile. And you also want to make sure that you're in bone space, because if you don't do that, your character is going to get really weird. Because it's wanting to do component space versus just within the, the local space of the bones. Once you set that up, it should move, but in my case, it's not moving. Because I didn't choose my bone. So let me do that again. Oops. All right, so now as you can see, we can just start moving it around with the handle because I'm affecting the root. And those are things I'm going to expose to my controller so that, hey, I need to move the X direction of my controller. That's going to move this part. And the Y on my controller, because it's X and Y, is going to be the Z, which is going to move it up and down. So basically, as you're moving it around, it'll be something like this. That's yeah. so cool. And that's kind of just the basics yeah. of it. That really gets you going. And you can figure out from that point, that's how the arms work. That's how everything else works when you want to use IK. Mm -hmm. um, and it's as simple as that. Unreal has some really awesome notes for that. Um, I'm also using this other one called CCD IK, which is constant collision, I want to say, or something like that. Um, and it's a sort of the same thing. I'm just selecting the tip bone and I'm selecting all the bone or the, the end bone and everything that's going to go in between it will move with your effector. So like I said, the effector location is the big one that you're going to need to expose for Unreal to be able to, so you can actually move it. And that's how you would do it with motion controls. That's how you would do it with anything else. And like like puppets are different. <laughs> yeah, and puppets are different from like a third person character. Like third person characters, we're just moving something along, and you're just kind of depending on velocity and things like that. The character moves, but we're like in video games, we're hardly ever really controlling the arms and stuff like that. So unless you guys have played Heavenly Bodies, so where you're moving like your arms and your legs, yeah, awesome mm. stuff. Also very hard. Okay, so so now that I'm out of my animation blueprint, I want to understand how do I actually move the arms. So, so this is the whole thing. Hopefully we have enough time. We can get into this and I can actually show the puppet. So, so basically what you want to do is you want to be able to make a blueprint with your skeleton. And it's pretty easy. You're just making an actor. So you would right click blueprint, choose actor. It'd give you a new blueprint. <laughs> Um, depending on your type of character that you want to make. In my case, it's pretty simple. I'm just using an actor. And you want to be able to use that skeletal mesh that you've added, which is this, like I said, it's still called Dino in my thing. I haven't changed it to Rat or anything like that. So it's just this Dino <laughs> science fiction sort of thing that I made. And I'm basically just saying, hey, I need to get at that animation blueprint. So they need an animation instance to grab from that skeletal mesh you need to then cast it to your animation blueprint this may be different in control rig i'm not exactly sure and then you just need to spit out a variable for that animation blueprint so that you can get at that thing that i call jaw rotate or head rotate things like that so um so once you have that you basically just you get at those variables. So this one was called jaw rotate. And you basically just click off of here and you say, hey, I remember that name. Get or I want to set the rotation. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set the rotation of that jaw. And from there, you figure out, hey, what, how do I want to control that? Which controller piece do I want to use? So I'm going to use the trigger for that. For me, for puppeting, it's a lot easier to use a trigger for that because it also gives me a little more control over how much I'm open up the mouth. And so on your trigger, you always have a zero to one. Mm -hmm. And that's called the, the axis, the axis value in your, and what I'm basically doing is lurping or 
interpolating between two positions. So you have your closed mouth and your open mouth. So zero would be closed mouth and one would be open mouth. So that's just how it works. And yeah, so that's how the jaw works. And the hands, it's a little trickier because there is, this is like total basic math. There's not a lot to do with it because when you're moving around things with your controller, controllers are like negative one to one when it comes to a joystick move. And those are the sort of the values you get unless you create your own like input values. I'm, you know, I won't get to that. So this is very basic. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't want to consume input for this because if you do that, it consumes input across the board. And if you have a second puppet in there, it's not going to work. Mm. So, so I'm basically just multiplying those numbers by a bigger number so that I can actually move those things around. So I had exposed those effectors, the left hand and the right hand. I just need to move them. So zero to one is not going to work. You need to move them in a bigger space. You just multiply them by a bigger number and just kind of see what works. There's kind of a lot of magic numbers involved. There's nothing that's like, I don't have a formula to say like, oh, this works across all puppets because it doesn't. Sometimes I'll import something and it's a little smaller or it's bigger and those spaces are a little bit longer for the um, up to reach. So you just need to mess around with those numbers and those actually control the effectors. So it's actually controlling your IK. Okay. Wow, yeah. And that's basically how puppetry works. And let me just actually pop out of that and I'll pop into this really quick. Yeah. This is the, where the magic happens. I remember Wes, when yeah. you and I first saw this the other day, we were just completely in awe. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, yeah, it's so amazing. Yeah, so this guy's basic controls. I'm only using the Xbox controller. I'm not doing anything crazy. And I'm just moving the head around. I'm just moving the arms around. The arms are mirrored. Um, once I figure out, or once they start adding in certain features for... Uh, motion controls without VR because hair doesn't work in VR yet. It's a lot of things that don't work in VR. So in normal and able to do those things, you need to be able to put on the headset in my scenarios. But I think Unreal is working on that or Epic's working on that. So until then, I'm just using a controller and it works out pretty good because the IK works, the jaw works with the trigger, heads move around, find the IK as you can see here. So kind of added, like, <laughs> little hanging things that just make it look a little more dynamic. I've added like skin change. I don't know if you can really see it here. Oh, yeah. You can see it. The material actually changes dynamically. I'll add in more. That's very cool. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. All these interesting things. It's all. And it's all real time. Right? I just wanted to make sure that everything was real time. I didn't have any baked animations. Um, what you could do, you could do animations and you can trigger those animations with your controller, just like you would in a typical video game. So that's how this guy works. And yeah, let me um, actually bring up another puppet if you guys don't mind. That's I'm still in shock and awe. I don't think I'll ever no. get used to that. <laughs> There's something so <laughs> mesmerizing about it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so amazing. This is like the coolest thing i've ever seen it's super fun to do i think it's just you know it's a lot of time i don't know why a lot of people haven't done it i i think it's it's been done in the industry a lot but most of the time it's like motion capture and things like that i'm not trying to do a lot of motion capture stuff because if i do give this to somebody they don't have to spend you know 10 grand or even have to set up their iphone or anything else like that to capture all these performances you can do it all real time and with the controller, just play the EXE file and you're good to go. Cool. Um, Which so controller me, are you using too? Just to ask. Is I'm just controller? using a standard Xbox controller. I'd use a PlayStation <laughs> one, but I think there's the FTK, <laughs> which I do not have, so. Hilarious. So yeah, this, is, this guy, I'll show you the raw format first. He's got these particle emitters that happen. So if you move too fast, his hair will kind of fly out. You don't really see that. In like, I think compression's not awesome. So it's a lot of those things you don't see. Um, and then it's just kind of simple lighting setup. So I typically do like lights on the side. I'll typically do like a cool light and a warm light. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that just kind of brings out more of the highlights. And then I'll uh, bring in some other lights. And I have a spotlight that sits on top. And I should also show that, because I think a lot of people have also been interested in how I move the head along with the camera. So all I'm doing is I'm tracking a, a ball, basically. Because you can't track certain like bones. So I'm tracking a, a ball that is connected to a, the head bone. And what that does is it allows the camera to follow that around. And then you just add like certain things like camera shape or little things that will give it a little bit more than just a static feel. Mm -hmm. I'm always about the attention the details, I think that's the thing that's really going to set anything apart. It's just be cognizant of these little things that happen. And so, and this is also my focus ball. So if it's like focused way out here, then the focus of the, the lens will be further out. So that's how that works. And it's basic. Like you just select which actor to track. It's really simple. Use the eyedropper. If you know one really, you probably know all this stuff already. It's just, and I'm also using a cinema camera. Uh, those just work better in my scenario. Mm -hmm. And I'm always grabbing the cinema camera as my main camera. So I have like a little blueprint that's set up for all that stuff as well. And all the game settings that I need. Because I'm trying to also get it to run on like smaller platforms. I have a Steam Deck that I've been wanting to mm -hmm. run. Mm -hmm. I have a puppet yeah. running on it. And it looks pretty cool, but it's a little slow. So, but anyways, yeah doing that kind of stuff as well. So let me go back into here and press play. And so yeah, this guy, hopefully he runs, there he goes. <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> He's like really hard with the controller. He's got his blinks. He also has this like, crazy side tilt. And then I've added like extreme side tilt so he can just be like super dramatic. <laughs> and so yeah, as you can just kind of see how the fur works. The fur interacts pretty good. I need to add like some collision onto the face because yeah, you just go right through. <laughs> so, so some things like in videos, I'll just make sure that hey, you don't do those sorts of things if you want to show like puppets. And there's something so like realistic about watching it too, almost human. Maybe it's because it's being actively controlled by you, but. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, really cool. it's it's really fun. It, it's just kind of, I mean, it look, probably looks a little bit different on stream. I mean, it looks pretty good inside of Unreal. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's been really fun. I think when I made this one, it was sort of an eye opener of how you can do things. And I just add these expressions without having a lot of expression, right? It's just the mouth and it's just the eyes. But it's like you get like these weird things of wonder. And this guy's always just either happy or really sad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so cool, <buddy. laughs> yeah. Like, all these different things. I haven't added voices or anything like that. That's another big question I always get. Like, huh? How come you don't add sound? First, I just don't have a lot of time. <laughs> so sound is like another <laughs> thing I have to do. And eventually I'll I'll get to that. Um I mean, I have sound people that would be happy to do stuff, but I also um, I also want to do all that stuff by myself as well because it is it's always learning, and I love learning about this. I love the process of all this. It's it's really really fun. Let me show one more. And it's cool because while you're bringing that. Oh, sorry, Val. <laughs> oh no, it's good. I was just yeah. saying that the scenes are different, which are really cool. Yeah. Uh, while you're bringing that up, there was one question that came in about asking about uh, transforming, transform high poly character and low poly rigging with other. Uh, basically, it was just something you covered earlier. I was just going to bring up that, yeah, you, you did that in another app. It was done in like Cinema 4D. The mesh was created in Modeler, but you can use any app. It could have been Blender or Maya or anything. Uh, but right. yeah, that's wherever all that stuff was done. Yeah, you just want to make sure that your poly counts aren't super high because just bending stuff. It becomes, it's just memory, it's, it's intensive. If you can keep it at a certain amount of polys, like 100,000 is, is fine for me. Like some characters are way more than that, but those are really good people who are doing those, the rigging. I'm not one of those people. I'm like, hey, I just need this thing to work. And so I'm not gonna go 
my super high poly because I don't want to spend a lot of time binding the bones and it's like, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. So if I can keep it a little bit easy, then yeah, I'm all for it. Um, let me see here. This one. This is one of the newer ones. It's a little more complex because it has like flying abilities, but it's not. Man, that's so cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I think I might have changed some settings where it's going down super slow. But a lot of the things are based off of velocity. So if it's dropping down really fast, the wings will come and settle as you're moving along. And then it just has these basic kind of controls of. The chat is going crazy right now. That pupil dilation yeah. is it's the stuff of dreams. I feel like I'm watching a Pixar. Um, yeah. Right <laughs> yeah, the pupil stuff was one of the reasons why I wanted to make my own like modular eyes because uh, it's easy for me to be able to add those things in and just pop them into the character. And yeah. since they follow the camera in this instance, it's pretty nice. That's cool. That it actually works in. And I have like a whole bunch of variables set up for uh, how high is it going to fly or how much is it going to do this and how, you know, are the wings going to work? And, yeah. and your scenes are so beautifully done too. Like we've got rolling fields of grass here. <laughs> Nanite? Yeah, well, the grass, yeah, I think these are Nanite. Um, yeah, once they added Nanite foliage, it's just like mm -hmm. an explosion of ideas of things that you can start to do. Uh, and being able to move them, I think that was a big portion of it. Um, a lot of times for like work, I've had to move like grass and things like that. So just finding out like fun ways of moving that stuff around and how does the character affect grass? So there's a lot of things involved with that as well. And, you know, just like adding the sky and adding clouds and things like that. I mean, Unreal is pretty great at letting you do a lot of this stuff. Oh yeah, most of it was actually created in Modeler. All these, um, like a lot of the stuff. I actually used Illustrator for the <laughs> to make the silhouettes of the grass. Oh, that's cool. And just exported that and turned it into a three D mesh. And so, and I've been using Illustrator for like twenty something years. So for me, it's just, some of these tools I just I've had in my back pocket for so many years. No, yeah, but I remember how to do that, and it'd be hard. To for me to do that anywhere else, so. Right. Wow. So, yeah. Incredible. I'm speechless. <laughs> it's a fun, yeah. It's a fun process. It's, it can be a little time consuming, but also when it's all said and done, like Wes, you were asking like, how long does it actually take? Like for that one character that has all the furries, the claws and everything else, I mean that, that took a couple of days only because it was, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So it was like one day for the modeler, which was only like the hour or whatever it was. And then I was thinking about, oh, I should probably add textures to it, which was the next day. I was going kind to of spend some time doing the texture work, which didn't take me that long to do texturing, maybe two hours. And then to actually bring it all into Unreal and make it work, that process for me now is pretty close to an hour or two also. So, when you break it all down, for me, it's about a three to four hour process to actually make the stuff, to, to make a puppet, which isn't that bad considering um, that, you know, if you were to do this in a production setting, it's usually weeks before one character is made, which is understandable because it is a lot of work. Yeah. And so we're at the end of our stream today. Uh, is there any last words from um, either you, Ryan, or Wes? Thank you both for coming on here. Oh, it's awesome. And Ryan, it was so cool to be on here with you, man. Uh, always appreciative to chat with you both. It's, it's always been great. Adobe's been really fun to just, everybody there has been really awesome to work with. Um, I've always, yeah, ever since day one, I've been using Modeler for, gosh, has it almost been two years? Or a little over, I mean, it's been over a year yeah. what the GDC was. So, yeah, it's, it's been a journey, but everybody's been super nice and, yeah, just love it. And Val's always been awesome, all this stuff. So. 
That's great. Yeah. And so thanks everyone else who also tuned in and chatted with us today. Um, always exciting to have you be excited about what we're excited about. Um, it's always, it's, it's a great time when we are able to get together and actually chat as artists and see what we're doing. And thank you so much for sharing your insight, Ryan. I think it's always really yeah. cool to see what you're up to, especially when you see like things on Twitter, right? And you go, oh, okay, well, I could never possibly do that. And to have you be so gracious to actually walk us through your, your process was, yeah, sure. really something else. And thanks, Wes, for coming on. It's always like a pleasure to have you on too. You have such an exuberant em energy about you. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Wes was like the best for GDC. I mean, when I was at the end of my talk and he came up there, it was like this big sigh of relief and just his, just the mannerisms and everything else. It's just, yeah, it was calming. I felt really safe. Well, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's the thing I wanted to say. Like, I mean, ever since I met you at that, the GDC, Ryan, it was like, I was just so impressed. You were so, um, just inspiring with how you work and how you come up with ideas. And I have to say, like, even after the weeks that we've been talking about this project, like, I feel like, oh, man, I, I have a better outlook on what I can do because I'm like, well, Ryan did this and he had this mindset. So, dude, you sharing all this that you've done, it's you're super inspiring, Ryan. Seriously, like, thank, thank you. you. This has just been amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're so wholesome. Uh, <laughs> incredible yeah. stream. Um, all righty. Yeah. So... In terms of moving forward, uh, if anybody wants to reach Ryan in future, it's, uh, we have some questions as to whether or not you're available for freelance work. I will let you answer those on your own DMs. Um, I'll yes. Pop that into the chat for Twitter. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you can either DM or even chat with us uh, in our Discord, which I'll also toss into the chat. And I believe, Wes, we also have another Substance live stream coming up this Thursday that you're attending. Yep, Thursday, yep. Yeah, cool. So um, come back, same channel, uh, different people, except for Wes, you'll be there. But mm -hmm. same, <laughs> same energy. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.